Good evening. Um, I, this lecture will be completing the remainder of section two. Uh, basically, we're going to be going from topical guide objective 215 all the way to, uh, I think it's, we're actually going to scroll properly. Uh, we're going to go all the way to the end here to 2.23, and we're going to go through homework to, uh, example question 2.9. Now, the idea that we were just covering is the concept of the difference between when you're counting for race conditions and you are accounting for the lowest possible area. What are the trade-offs? Well, your trade-offs are that the higher area allows you to uh, ensure that the there's no propagation of race conditions. So we were talking about the combinational circuit last uh, time, and we had this issue where we had that little five nanosecond blip like the example that I show uh, for the report and the reason why is because we had to insert a buffer so you have a little bit of higher area however you make up for it by ensuring that proper functionality of the circuit so in this case we're going to talk about a couple of uh, circuit optimization techniques that I want to review um, a prime implicant is a product term obtained by combining the maximum possible number of adjacent squares in a map to a rectangle where the number of squares is a power of two. And an essential prime implicant is, and it's, is known as essential if it is the only prime implicant, implicant that covers one or more of the min terms. This is 2.16. So here we have an instance of a K map. And this is our example where uh, we can cover with the rectangles like this, as we see here. The example's over here, so I'm drawing them out. But rectangles, one, two, three, four. We can cover this one here with power of two, power of two, or we can even go with power of four here. Let me undo that last one. So in this particular one, we can do this. Now, as you see here, these two specific uh, min terms are only covered by one of our P subcubes. The instances where it's only covered by one, so in this case, these two, these are, are our essential prime implicants. Those two. This means, as I say, there, it means there's two of them here, and I've redrawn the K-map to show specifically which two are the essential prime implicants. Now, scrolling down a little further, the squares of the essential prime implicants must be included in the final reduction. So I'm going to move this down here just so uh, it's more clear. So given the following, using a K-map, and this also zoom in, Okay, so I think we can even uh, page width. That should be better. Okay, so given the following, use a Carnot map to derive the input function for a circuit with no race conditions. So when I say with no race conditions, that means I'm not going to require you to cover them all. State the essential prime implicants and calculate the total input cost. So now we're starting to build up to a uh, larger circuit. So we have our min terms listed here. 3, 4, 5, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, and our max terms are 0, 1, 2, 6, 7, 8, and 9. So, result we have our terms 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, right? And then we have our, oh, that's going a little too fast for it, here, here, here and here and so we have prime equivalence for a naught d so a naught is here and d is here so that's this one a c so that's a and c so that's this one c d which is this one here and a b d naught 
AB, D naught, which are these two. So our central prime implicant, since only 1010, let me scroll back up here a little bit. Since only 1010, 0001, and 1100, so this would be 1010, 0, 0, so that's this one, 0, 0, 0, 0001, that's this one, and 1100, 0, 0, so we have 1100. 0, 0. Those three are, are our essential prime implicants, 1, 2, and 4, so that's 1, two and four. Those are our essential prime implicants. So phrasing the question and go back up and see that state the essential prime implicants. So one, two, and four, you need to state those. Now next, we redraw, I've redrawn the K map with our three essential prime implicants. So I have this one here, this one here, and this one here, right? So since we have to have no race conditions, that means we have to eliminate it. Now we have a disjoint set. We have to add this square here. Let me change it to blue. We have to add this square here. So the ones that I'm going to put in purple are the essential prime implicants that we had before. So one, two, and that's the three essential prime implicants. And the blue one is the one that we added to eliminate the race condition. And then from there, we see that this one is one, one here, right? So that means it's B and it's in one, one here. So it's CD. So 1, 1 ties to these two, and then 1, 1 ties to this row. So that's how we came up with BCD. So then the function becomes A not D, or AC, or BCD, or ABD not. So now the next part of the question is calculate the gate input cost. So our literal, the way we calculate 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That's 10. Next we have gates. Remember it's the input gate cost. So it is one, two, three, four. So that's where you get four here. Inversion, we have one, two inverts. So that's two. So you get 10, four, and two, which becomes 16. So combining concepts. Now we have combinational circuit building blocks. So now we're gonna take these K maps and try to use multiplexers and field programmable gate arrays to synthesize our circuit. So the field programmable gate array, or as you'll see in future implementation, FPGAs, is an integrated circuit designed to be configured using a hardware description language, such as VHDL. They use logic blocks for implementation of the required function. So as, you, as we've seen before, we were using AND gates, OR gates, NOR gates to build up to logic blocks. So we're now, and if we recall, we're going to go from, from the objective, we're going from MSI to VLSI. So now we're using these logic blocks arranged in two-dimensional arrays to accomplish this objective. These interconnection wires are organized as horizontal and vertical routing channels. So the way they are going to be arranged, I'm going to scroll down here once the computer allows me to is you're gonna have a bunch of these cells, which are known as lookup tables, which we'll go over in a minute, and they're gonna be connected horizontally and vertically. And your synthesis tool, which is what the VHDL is gonna be using, so uh, we're gonna be going down to synthesis. So when you're compiling, it's gonna load your logic into lookup tables based on these stored values. So we're gonna go over this next. A lookup table is used in FPGA to implement small logic functions preloaded into storage cells. So you have 0, 1, 
And then based on multiplexers, so you have X2 here and then X1. So let's say we do 1, 0, 1, 1, right? Now, one in X1, X2, so if it's going to be 0, 0, we're going to select 1. If it's 0, 1, we're going to select 0. 1, 0, and this is X1 and X2. And then 1, 1 becomes these, respectively. So that's how, so lookup tables are going to take your logic and store it in these lookup tables. Now, the reason why it's important to use structural VHDL, as you discussed earlier about this large area bloat, if you're relying just on the synthesis tool, you're going to require a lot more of these lookup tables than you would normally need. So by doing the uh, structural, you're reducing the number of lookup tables, and therefore your area is decreasing. And so the number of inputs for the lookup table is natural log base 2 of n. So if it's 8, therefore you're going to need three uh, signals, right? So that's, that's what we mean by the number of inputs. So let's say we have a function here, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. So this would be here we'd have... Um, in this case, A naught, B naught, C. And then, and then for A, it's going to be A, B, or C naught. And that's our logic. So we load this in here, and using a 8-bit lookup table, we're going to produce our output based on these inputs. So demultiplexers, this is another useful tool that you can use to help select. So we have these select signals, right, going into the lookup table. So now how do we ensure that we have a select signal? So a demultiplexer is a single input signal and a selection of many data output lines, which is connected to the single input. So we have our single input signal, which correlates to F. And you can see F goes to each of these AND gates. And then you have, in this case, we have two input signals. Since this is a 1 to 4 demultiplexer, we have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Right? So if it's 0, 0, we're going to get this, these two input signals of the AND gate triggered. So then what happens, I'm sorry, it's going to be these two signals. If it's 0, 1, it's going to be these two signals. If it's 1, 0, it's going to be these two. And then if it's 1, 1, it's going to be these. And so then it just becomes which one of these is just going to propagate the value of F to one of these outputs. So based on the data output lines, we are able to select which one of these wires is going to be uh, used for uh, demultiplexing. So let's say I have uh, an input value of 0, 1, and f is equal to 0. So here's how we know it works. So a is going to be 0, so that means this one, right? So this one here, uh, this one here, and this one, uh, this one here, right? Sorry. So it's going to be this one, bingo, 0, 0, and then these two. Now, B is going to be 1, right? Since we have 0, 1, it's going to go here. And it's going to go uh, here. So since these two have these inputs, we're selecting C. So we've selected C, and so since F is 1, it's going to go to here. It's selected this one, so it's going to propagate the output here. So you're going to get 0, 0, 1, 0. Now if F was equal to 0 here, this would just propagate 0 here. Does that make sense? So to give you an example, here is the 
logic of a one to four D multiplexer. We have our behavioral, we have A, B, F, and O, and we have a standard logic vector as our output, like we went over in class last time. Now the whole idea of the standard logic vector, we have four outputs, so therefore it's three down to zero, so that's the notation. And so our inputs are A and B, these are our select signals. F is the value that we want to propagate, to, that we want to demux. And so now we have our architecture. So here I have created an inverter gate and an AND3 gate. So I've actually created VHDL that creates an AND gate here for a three input. And I was very similar. I did a structural one and I propagated it uh, by uh, five nanoseconds. Actually, what I did was I had a two input AND gate, had a buffer here, and then another two input AND gate. So the delay is actually going to be 10 nanoseconds for a three input AND gate. So what you want to do is you want to ensure that these values are getting here at the same time. And so the inverters didn't have a delay. So as a result, I invert A to give me, and B to give me input A and invert B as signal wires, and then just mapped the vector 03, 02, 01, and 00 to the output. And based on that, we are able to create our 4 to 1D multiplexer. So on assignment two, I want you to do one that does a 1 to 8 DMUX. Logic synthesis. Mul now, here's why multiplexers and uh, DMUXs and, uh, are very uh, useful in terms of being able to synthesize logic. So now, look at the property of here. So we have A is 0. We have a logic function where B is equal to F and 1 where B is equal to, let's say F is equal to the inverse here, right? So if we have A is 0, these are our values in the K-map. And the reason why this is useful is instead of having to create AND gates, we can use a multiplexer to select here. So if it's 0 here, it's just going to propagate B to the output. But if we have 1, then it's going to invert B and give us our value. So that's how we can use multiplexers to be a little higher than having to deal with AND gates and OR gates. As we mentioned up here a little earlier, um, we want to look up in the FPGA implementation above AND gate and OR gate primitives. So you use multiplexer logic to accomplish this. And we're going to talk a little later about something called Shannon expansion, which allows us to, um, and the whole idea behind Shannon expansion is that it's a proof that shows that every logic function can be decided as a subfunction of one of the variables. So if you have a is equal to zero, then the function's going to be uh, b, and if a is equal to one, then the function is going to be equal to b bar. And that's the whole idea of Shannon expansion. So here in example 2.4, we're going to design a x or b x or c using two to one multiplexers. So here's the logic for A, X, or B, X, or C. And the whole idea is that when A, we speak, as you can see, when A is zero, this just becomes equivalent to B, X, or C. So when only one of them is one, the value is one, but if both of them are one or both of them are zero, this becomes zero, which is the definition of exclusive or. We notice that if it's one, it's the exact opposite. So this becomes B X or C bar, right? So now we can mention this here. So when B is when B is zero exclusively, we want to propagate C. So we have B X or C, right? This means when B is zero, 
we see it's going to match C, right? When B is 1, it's going to match C bar, so we invert. Same thing matches. When B is 0, we get an inversion, and we get the inversion here. But we're going to deal with that later on. So we want the values to match. And what's going to happen is, as A is 0, we want to propagate B or C just fine. B, I'm sorry, B, X, or C here. So the multiplexers can perform XOR logic by using the one value as a control signal. Now we get A. If it's 0, we're just going to propagate B, X, or C. But if the A is 1, then we're going to invert B, X, or C. And then when A equals 0, therefore that's B, X, or C. When A equals 1, this becomes B, X, or C bar. And this is the definition of A, X, or B, X, or C. And so now we get to the Shannon Expansion Theorem that I alluded to a little bit ago. Shannon Expansion Theorem states that any Boolean function, and this is a function of all the variables, so variable 1 through variable n, can be written of the form function of w1 through wn equals f, w1 is 0, and 1, we have a different set through wn, and the meaning of this is there must exist a variable w where, and there's, this is true for all functions, there must, there must exist a variable w where all values of zero, sorry, all values of zero produce a logical calculation. So that's what this means, the dot, 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 all the way through wn. So this is a logical calculation. And where all logical values of one, which is this one here, produce a different logical calculation. So back up here, in this example, the Shannon expansion said, so when W1 is, wow, that was sloppy. When W1 is A, this means that when it's about zero, the function is equal to F. B equals, sorry, F equals B. So that's the Shannon expansion here. So then it becomes 1, therefore F equals B bar. So this is our different logical calculation. For this function, we found that when A is 0, we have B, X, or C. And when A is 1, we have B, X, or C bar. Now the interesting thing about this function is that you can break it down even further. When we find that a is 0 and b is 0, we have c, so f equals c. When b is 1, it becomes c bar. So when a is 1 and b is 0, we notice that this is f equals c bar. And here, f equals c when b equals 1 and a equals 1. So because of this, we can actually propagate the Shannon expansion backwards. So now we have A. This is where we get BX or C, BX or C bar. So it, the Shannon expansion works there. And here we have B is 0, and C is, and this becomes C bar. And by using the A, we can obtain that inversion that we found here, right? when we got the Shannon expansion about B. So that is how you can use Shannon expansion to reduce function calculations. So that's topical guide objective 2.20. So now let's design a majority voter using Shannon expansion about the variable A. So I'm getting all kinds of text messages while I'm lecturing you guys. So the Shannon expansion means that we're gonna use A to the breakdown from zero and one. And we're going to see what happens when we break it down this way. So if we look at zeros, this, this section of F and this section of the output function, we notice that well, we could do one of two things. We could draw out a K map, or we can observe that this is clearly 
B and C. And here, this is B or C. One, 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 one. Right? So now we have a, a Shannon expansion where we have our two logical calculations as we've defined earlier. So now we just take the multiplexer, and if it's zero, we get A and B. I'm sorry, B and C. So here's B and C when it's zero, right? And that propagates to our function output. And then when we get one, it becomes B or C. That's one, propagates to the output. So now we've used multiplexers to significantly reduce if we had to do k-maps with all of this or as we could just use the Shannon expansion to reduce the circuit size to this. So example 2.6 uh, should be, they should all be on the same page. Let me remedy this. Z. Okay, so example 2.6 is kind of a good catch-all type question. Um, I would expect a question on the exam very similar to this question. So we are given a function, a not b not, I'm sorry, a not c not, or a b or a c. So design the circuit using a two to one multiplexer and any other necessary gates. So what I mean by this is that I want you to use a multiplexer, as we have done in the previous question, and the other necessary gates, like in, in this example here, were the AND gate and OR gate. And the reason I'm doing it here is because we're event, um, I know that earlier in the chapter I have mentioned that lookup tables were not going to be using AND gate and OR gate logic. That's to give you a f uh, function, especially as you're starting to work with uh, compiling these signals and we start getting them onto a board. But in the meantime, I want you to understand how to do this so that way you can use this. Now, if we're really using a lookup table and a multiplexer, this would become uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. This would be uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, and then 0, 1, 1, 1. So we could have 8, and then we'd use three signals to pick the output. So that's how we would do it in a lookup table without AND logic. But in the meantime, I'll break this question down a little further. So using a two to one multiplexer and any other necessary gates. So that's what I mean by use a Carnot map to derive the input functions for each of the two inputs to the multiplexer for each variable. So here's what I mean. I'll allude to what the solution is. So here I have our two inputs, B or C, and I'm doing a Shannon expansion about A here, about B here, and about C here. This means that you're going to derive, and so eventually we're going to derive the input cost. And as a digital designer, you're going to tell me which one of these is the best. So that's the point of this question. So this is a good catch-all question to see how well, not just memorization, but can you apply it. So using a Carnot map to derive the input function for each of the two inputs for each variable. Is it? Then state the total input cost of Shannon expansion around each variable. Next, draw the circuit with the lowest cost only. You may you only use AND, NAND, OR, NOR, and invert gates. This is the inputs to the MUX for the final solution. So here's how we're going to do this. So draw it out, and you're given and you, I'm sorry, you will derive the truth table. So A naught, C naught, for 0, 0, because 0, 1 is not, doesn't meet any of these. 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1 here, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, because we have A, B, which matches that one. We have a 1 here, again, for, I'm sorry, for A, C, that matches that one. This is A, B here, 
which matches this one, and then A, B, and C, it matches this one. So we get 10100111. So now we're gonna re this problem is going to require three K maps. So for about A, which is about this variable, we get this one, this one here, and it's important to keep these separate so that way you can see, oh, hey, when A is 0, a not C or A B. So the next thing is how do we calculate the um, costs? So you're going to use a multiplexer to do this. So I want the cost for these. So here literal is one. Gate is one because it's only one here. And N is one since we have an inversion. For this one, we're calculating B or C. So literal is equal to two, one, two. Gate is equal to two and n is equal to zero. Now, what you're gonna do is you're gonna add these together and you're gonna get one, two, three, one, two, three, and then one, one, and three plus three plus one is seven. So let's do the same thing here for b. Creating the Carnot map. All right is this and then we're here and then there and there we get a not c not or a c for b equals zero and then we get a or c not so this becomes c not over for this one and then for a which is we'll make this one that's where we get that one so then one two three four that's the literal four there Gates, we have one, two for the input cost. And then for inverters, we have one, two. So that's how we get n equals two. For this, we have one, two for literals, because we have gates is also two. And we have one inverter, one inverter. So that becomes n equals one. We add these up, four plus two is six. Two plus two is four. One and two plus one is three. So we have six plus four plus three is 13. So now we know automatically that this one is better than B. So we now know that this is not going to be our final solution. I just had a thought. On an exam, I'm probably going to give you the min term list. So that way, I think that'll be faster than having to compare because I only have a certain amount of time to ask you. So on an exam, I'll, I'll give you uh, min terms of 0, 2, 5, 6, and 7. And then you can put this here. This becomes 0. This becomes 5, 6, and 7. I'll show you, there's one more. 0, 2. Yeah, 0, 2, 5, 6, and 7. For this one, this becomes 0. This becomes 0, 1, 0. So that's 1. So that's 2. So that mixes. So this becomes 1, 1, 0. So that's 6. This becomes 7. And this is 5. So that's how you make the K map there. And for C, since, since our, we're going to have 0, 2, 5, 6, and 7, we're going to look up 0, 0, 0, that's 1. 2, we're going to look up 0, 0, 1, that's not it. 0, 1, 0, that's it. 1, 1. 5 is going to be 1, 0, 1, so this becomes 1, 0, 1, so that one. 6 is 1, 1, 0. And 7 is 1, 1, 1. And remember, we did this in this order, so that way we could do K maps. So this becomes this value, this value, and this value become our P subcubes. So C naught, we're noticing that we have A naught. And here is B, so that covers this one. So it becomes A naught or B. And C becomes 1, 1, so this becomes A. So now we calculate it. We have our 1, 2 for literal 2, 
we have gates, one, two, or two, and one inversion, so n equals one. So here, this becomes one literal. It only requires one gate and no inversion, so n equals zero. Adding these together, we get two plus one is three. It was two, two plus one is three here. One plus zero is one, so you have t equals seven. So in this case, this problem has two, a and c, where the size is the same. So in this case, a or c may be correct. On an exam, I'm probably going to give you a two variable one. So I would give you something like f equals a not b or a b not, which is going to be a lot simpler, which will only require you to do them around a and b. So a or c may be correct. On an exam, pick one and draw a circuit. So in this case, since we determined that around a, it's going to be b or c. For if it's 1, and then C0 if it's 0. That's how we derive the circuit. And if it's about C, if A is 1, it's just A, right? But if it's around from 0, we have A0 or B. So that's how we come up with two designs. And for comparison, you don't need to include this on the TGO. I've just drawn this for your edification. This would be the size of the circuit if we designed it around B. So by using Shannon expansion and multiplication, I'm sorry, not Shannon expansion and multiplexing, we have been able to re significantly reduce the logical equivalent circuits. And that's why this is important. So from here, we get the decoder. So the decoder we define as a digital circuit that performs the conversion of an n-bit input code to an m-bit output code, where n is less than or equal to m, which is less than or equal to 2 to the n, such that a valid code word produces a unique output code. So here we have a. If a is 0, then we have 1 and 0, right? So that's how we decode it here. And if A is 0, it's going to invert, so we get 1 and 0. If we do 1, it becomes 0 and 1. So you see how we have a unique output code for each of these. So that's how we have a 1-bit to a 2-bit decoder. So this becomes a 2 to 4. Sorry, that's why I was making sure that I got the TGO for you. So 2 to 4 decoder, so I have two inputs, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, right? And so 0, 0 goes to this one. So if it's 0, 0, this is going to give me 1, 0, 0, 0, as we see here. If it becomes 0, 1, it's going to be 0 and 1. So it's going to go to D1 here. And if A is 1. If A is 1, B is 0, so A1 is going to be 1 here, right? And A0 is going to be 0, so it's A0. So now we select this one, so that's where we get our 1. So the rest of them will be zeros. If we have 0, 1, A is 0, and A1 is 0, and A1 is 1, so we select this one. And this one, so that becomes this one. So we get 0, 1, 0, 0, as our true table suggests. And then 1, 1, we get 1, 1 here. So this becomes 1, 0, 0, and 0. So now we can do something interesting. We can come up with a 2 to 4 decoder with an enable line. And the reason why you'd want to do this is you'd want to hold signals as we were doing with the tri-state buffer, until a clock pulse comes by, especially if we were doing an implementation in a data path. So, for example, if the enable signal is 1, now it's triggering all of these AND gates here. So we've doubled the number of AND gates, but because the enable signal is 1, 
it can now propagate the value. So if we have a1 is 1 and a0 is 0, so that is this case here. What's going to happen is it's going to go a1 is 1, so it'll trigger this AND gate and this AND gate. a0 is 0, zero so it's going to trigger this AND gate and this AND gate. So we have a 1 here. So now, because of the fact that we actually have this AND gate here, we can now have this value come out here. So now we have 0, 0, 1, and 0. As you see, if enable is 0, we're just going to hold all the values as 0. And we'll show you how this. So we have this here, and we have 1 and 0, so this becomes 1 and 0, right? And so we have a 1 here, but we still have a 0 here. Therefore, the enable does not propagate, and therefore we have all zeros. So now we're going to give another example of decoder expansion. So a 3 to 8 decoder, we have the example down here. Right? So we're going to be using a, a bunch of number of output AND gates is 8 because that's how many outputs we're driving in a 3 to 8 decoder. The number of inputs to decode is 3. The closest split to equal is 2 to 4 and 1 to 2 because 4 times 2 is 8. And that's what we're trying to get here. So, And the reason you can see this in this closest split to equal, this means that we have 4 input and 8, so we can break it down here and then break it down further. So if you were designing and you had designed a 4 to 1 demultiplexer, you can take those outputs, propagate the third output, inserting a buffer here to ensure, invert it here, then create your own 8-bit, I mean, sorry, your 8 AND gates and propagate the signal even further. And then if you want to do with an enable signal, you would do eight more AND gates where the input one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And then the other inputs would just go to the other input of those AND gates. So that's how you can use your primitives that you've designed. So you're going to be designing a four to one demultiplexer, and then you can use this 4 to 1 demultiplexer in the problem, as we've done earlier with other combinational circuits, to create a 3 to 8 demux. And then if you wanted to create a 4 to 16, what would we do? We would just create a different one. That's zoomed up for no reason here. We would just... You're killing me, Smalls. All right. So if we were here, we could have a third one. A3, right? And then we would propagate these here and then just create one where we have 16 AND gates where this would go to uh, zero, the first eight and this would go to the next eight. And then we'd propagate the output. And then if you wanted to do a 5 to 32, a 4, create an inverter here, 32 AND gates. So you're going to design an entity here for a 1 to 2 decoder, 2 to 4 decoder, which you can, as you can, you can use that there, 3 to 8 decoder. And then I want you to build all the way from a 5 to 32 bit decoder in VHDL. And we're doing this in the MIPS data path design because we're going to need a 32-bit value. We need we have 32 registers in MIPS in these faster registers, but I have five bits to determine which is they are. So we use a 5 to 32-bit decoder to select which signal we are doing. And then Decoders may be used to design logic functions. So this example question is how do we do that? Example 
using a 3 to 8 decoder and two input OR gates only, design a logic circuit that implements the following function. So we have min terms 2, 4, and 5. Well, we could draw a K map and we could then design the circuit. We could do Shan expansion, figure out which one's the lowest. Or we can just use this 3 to 8 decoder since we have a 3. There's a, this doesn't go above 7. Since we have 0 through 7 here as our outputs, we can just use a select signals to select which ones. Now, 2, 4, and 5 means that these are the only three outputs we want. So using a 2 input OR gate, 4 or 5, or 2. Simple enough. So if we were changing this to, say, 0, 1, and 6, and 7, we would just use the same 3 8 decoder, and we have 0, 1, so we could use an OR gate here, 0, 1, 6, and 7, OR gate there, OR gate there, and that's our output. Now, using 3 to 8 decoders and a 2 input AND and 2 input OR gates only, design a logic circuit that implements the following function. So we have a 4 input signal here, 1, 6, 12, 17, 27, and 31. But here I've limited to 3 to 8 decoders. So how do we do that? Well, first, we're going to break it down. If you recall from earlier when we were talking about breaking it into sections based on binary uh, values. We have a 3, 8 decoder here, and we can use a 3, eight to, 3 to 8 decoder here. We're only selecting 0, 1, 2, and 3. So here we're selecting 1, 6, 4, 1, 3, 7. So what you do in this kind of problem is you split it in 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3, 3. And here you have 2, 1, 6, 4, 1, 3, and 7. So then what you do is you just use, since we split it up into two pieces, we have two decoders. And so this runs the bottom and this runs the top. And from here, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, which is how many min terms we had. So we have here, this comes from 0 and 1, right? So 1 was one of our values, so that's how we get our output functions. Next, we have this value is coming from 0 and 6. So this becomes 1 and 6, just like we were predicting. Here, this one comes from 1 and 4. So this becomes 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, which becomes 8. I'm sorry, 8, 12. So 8 plus 4 is 12. From here, we have 2 and 1. So this becomes 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. This becomes 17, because this is 16 plus 1. And here, 3 and 3. So this becomes 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So this becomes 16, 24, 27. And then our last value comes from 3 and 7, which since this is the top and this is the bottom, we have 3 and 7, and that turns out to be 31. So that's how we use our 3 to 8 decoders and take those outputs to reduce the amount of coding that we would need to do. I'm sorry, the, the amount of area overhead. And then we will finish up section 2. If we know about decoders, we're going to learn about encoders.
So a binary encoder is a digital circuit that performs the conversion of a 2 to the n input into an n bit code. So here, for example, actually let me read off the rest of the definition and then we'll go into this. For each input combination, exactly one input should have a value of 1. And the outputs present present the binary number that, which I, that identifies which input is equal to 1. So what this means is we have four inputs. Right? So that's 2 to the n, so n is equal to 2. And so the n here and n here correspond to the number of outputs, hence our n bit code. So here, the values are only going to have a one of the values to being 1, and all the rest are going to be 0. So if 1, if w0 is 1, guess what? Neither 0 or 1 is touched, so we're going to have 0, 0, which is what we expected. If 1, let's see, w1 is equal to here, so it's going to hit this OR gate and propagate. So we have 0, 1. Y1 here is the majority bit. When y, W2 is 1, so this one goes here. 1, 0, which is what we see here. And then 1 is going to go to both of these to generate 1, 1, which is what we see here. And then likewise, you're using, you want y2, y1, and y0. We're doing this uh, code here. We have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. Right? So y0, we have, so to add to the figure, we have d0. None of these are going to touch it, right? So therefore, y0, y1, and 2 aren't. So d1 is the only one here, right? 0, 0, 1. So as you can see, d1 only goes to this OR gate, so y0 is the output. So d2 only goes here, so this becomes 0, 1, 0, so that's 2. And then d3 goes to both of these, so you have 0, 1, 1, so that's 3. D4 only goes here, so that becomes 1, 0, 0. D5 goes to 1 here, so it becomes 1, 0, 1. D6 goes to 1 in here, so it becomes 1, 1, 0. And then D7 goes to here, here, and here. So we get 1, 1, 1. So that's how we do encoding. So we take a bunch of signals and we encode them into a smaller value. So we have two to the n signals that we encode into an n bit output. So if you have a decoder, you have an n bit signal that is encoded and we decode it into a two to the n bit value. So a good way to test your encoders and decoders is let's say you have a uh, eight to three encoder like this. So you take your, you design it, and then you get your three outputs, and then you put it to a 3, 2, 8 decoder. And then you get your eight outputs. And guess what? If it's D0, you're going to get 0, 0, and then you're going to get D0 on the output, even though D0 is not connected. And so these are the... Uh, Last VHDL assignment, so we've, I believe we have read. Okay, so we're going to go over priority encoders, and then we'll be done. So, so we have a two to one encoder, four to two encoder, eight to three encoder. I should read encoder. So then, for the MIPS data path, we want to design a thirty-two to five encoder in VHDL. So then the last problem, as you can probably tell, hook up your 5 to 32 decoder from to the 32 to 5 encoder that you designed earlier 
to test the accuracy of both designs. Now, as you can see, you're using the 1 to 2, 4 to 2, 8 to 3 to build up to the 32 to 5. And then we are using the 1 to 2, 2 to 4, 3 to 8 to build up to 5 to 32 for the decoder. So you're going to be using all of these entities, which also have AND gates and OR gates and inverters, to design these decoders. So now you're using all of these values to figure out your result. Tell me the propagation delay. So you should, if you have a 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. Also, as you know, your encoder uses multiplexers too. So now you've used everything that you've designed so far. And then you're going to get, let's say, 20 nanosecond delay. You're going to get 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Actually, it's going to be 0, 1, 0, 0. This is going to be 5 bits. But as you're building them, instead of having to build a 32 to 5 or a 5 to 32 every time, you can use your smaller designs to build the bigger one so it becomes easier. So the last thing we're going to do is we're going to design a, what is known as a priority encoder. And a priority encoder is a digital circuit that compresses binary inputs into the smallest number of outputs. The output of a priority encoder is the binary representation of the original number starting at zero of the most significant input bit. So what this means here is that you can arrange your inputs of your encoder to have a priority. So what this means is we uh, have, if two or more inputs are given at the same time, the input having the highest it priority will take precedence. It often used to control interrupt requests. So this is at the operating system level. So you, let's say you have, uh, we have four inputs here in the example problem, and we've assigned priorities to the processes. So you have D3, D3, D2, D1, and D0. Actually, it looks like I changed it. D3, D2, D1, and D0. Yes. So now we have, if they're all zero, it doesn't matter, right? We haven't selected any, so we want Z to be zero. And the reason I define this value Z in the problem, well, actually, let me read the problem for you first. I'm going a little too fast. 2.9, design a 422 priority encoder where the input priority is D3, D2, D1, D0. Actually, D0, D1, and D2. That's, I didn't change it in the notes, but it is changed in the problem. I thought that was wrong. So what this means is if D3 is 1, I don't care what these values are. I want 1, 1 here. If D0 is 1, I want it to be 1, 0. So normally we would just have it 1, 1, 1, right? And this would apply to 1, 0, 0, 1, and 0, 0. But the priority says, I sure I want this to be 1, 1, but I want D0 to be 1, 0. So the numbers are a little less. 1 here becomes 0, 1. And then last but certainly not least, D2 as the lowest priority. So this becomes 0, 0. And the value Z here is a check bit where 0 means that we don't have anything. And if we have any of these values otherwise, it's going to be 1. So we check Y1. And you notice it's that it's D3 or D0. And then for Y0, we have D3 or D1, D0 bar. Because if I have D1 here, I don't want, I only want the instance where one of them is the case. So that's why we put this here and we put this here. So D0 not, D0 not D1. So then our final circuit, and this is the end of section two becomes D3, D1, D0, 
and D1. If you notice D2, just like before, kind of gets hooked into a wire here because it doesn't really matter to our calculation. Just like before, up here in the encoder, we go all the way up here. See how W0 doesn't get hooked to anything? Because our logic calculation, it doesn't matter. We, there's no instance where W0 is going to contribute to a 1 on the output. Likewise, we, are not, we don't have an instance where D2 contributes to a 1 on the output. You see the logic here? D3, D0, D3, D0, and D1. D2 never does anything. So, we will end this with a section here. So D1, see D3 is going to go here and here. So Z is this output. This indicates that the value is valid. D0 is going to go here. Yeah, that's right. D3 or D0, 3D bar. So this should be D0 and D3 bar to this input. D0 bar or D1 so and D1 or D3 here, because Y0 is also 1 if D3 is equal to 1. So that is our final circuit. And in class, I'm going to be asking questions about uh, if you guys have any questions about this. I'm sure there will be. Um, the homework is going to be TGO. We started at 2.15 all the way through... Give me this one up here, which is 2.23. So that shouldn't be too bad, 2.23. And then the example questions are 2.6 through 2.9, I believe. Two point four through two point nine. Make sure you have a good understanding of at least 2.6. And um, based on what we get done in next class, I'll tell you if there's anything else we're going to emphasize. So this is your homework assignment right here. All right. Have a good weekend.